Hey, uh, let's bring in our guest on the program. He is the president of the West Virginia Education Association, Dale Lee. He's playing hurt today, so we're going to take good care of him. Dale, good morning to you, my man. Good morning, and where do I get one of those autographed uh, radon kits? <laughs> we'll have to mail one to you. We'll have to yeah, send okay. a self-addressed stamped box. Great. Uh, make, it, make it personalized to Dale. That would be very nice. How you feeling, man? You, you got you got uh, the bug? Yeah, I got a little stomach bug last night and, and a little under the weather today, but, but I'll, I'll be fine. No, I appreciate you playing hurt today, my man. Uh, Dale, I saw on the Metro News website today that the House Education Committee has passed the Third Grade Success Act. Uh, and I've been talking with, uh, we talked to the superintendent of schools, Bondi Shea Gibson Learn, last week, and she mentioned uh, in a roundabout way she was not necessarily in favor of that act. She doesn't believe in holding kids back, uh, generally speaking, is, uh, counterproductive. Can you give me your thought process on on this particular bill and any other education bills that you're watching this session? Well, I think you have to rely on the on the teacher, the expert. To the teacher knows when a child needs to stay back or or not. And I think if you give that teacher enough resources and enough uh, uh, time with that child, they'll be able to get them where they need to be. Now, I, I do like that we're putting extra set of hands and eyes in, in the K-3 through and that uh, we're really focusing on that. The House yesterday passed a bill to look at uh, uh, dyslexia and, and uh, dyscalculia, the, the uh, math portion of, of dyslexia. Uh, so there's some, some testing and training for that. I think uh, the, the key to this... And what you could do it in a different way too. You could just make smaller class size. Uh, right now we have 20 in kindergarten and 25 first through third. Uh, but but you could do the same thing, given that kindergarten teacher 15 and and the first second third grade teachers 18. Uh, you have an opportunity to bring the kids where they need to be. If you did that, is there a calculation for how many more teachers you would need? Oh, it's quite a few. It's it's uh, it's an expensive endeavor, but when you have a billion dollar surplus, what you have to make your priorities on where you want to spend your money, and do you want to spend it on the chil- children of West Virginia, or, or how do you, how do you choose to spend that? Well, I'm looking at it more from a perspective of there are some things money can't buy, and right now. Uh, if something is not in production, you can't buy it. And one of the things we're not producing a lot of these days is teachers. That's right. And that's that's the second part of that bill. Even by putting the uh, paraprofessionals in there, where are you going to find them? Even if you reduce class size, where are you going to find them? I looked at the uh, Higher Ed Policy Commission website, and the number of students, kids going into education has reduced from 2012, there were a little over 800, and uh, 2021, 414. I mean, people are just not going into education field. So where are you going to find all these people? And we don't have an answer for that, do we? No, we don't. We don't. It, and it's, it's a lot of factors involved in that. Of course, the competitive pay is, is, a, is a factor. Uh, but... You know, when when the legislature wants to dictate everything in the classroom, and, and I had this conversation with them uh, uh, a week or so ago in, in Senate Ed, they had a bill that um, would require a, a class in personal finance in, for our public schools, private schools, parochial schools, and uh, denominational schools. And Senator Roberts, who has a Christian school, amended it to take out the private schools, parochial schools, and the uh, uh, denominational schools. And so they called me up to, to testify, and I said, look, you you just took that out of them, but you're putting more and more requirements on our public schools. And uh, the Senator Chapman from Ohio County said, well, our public dollars are going to that. Don't you think we should mandate how it's spent? Sure. And our public dollars are now going to homeschools and private schools and parochial schools and 
and denominational schools with Pope scholarships. So why are they exempt? And, so you can't have it both ways. And some of those schools are out of state as well, I might add. Sure, absolutely they are. Matt Miller. Uh, Dan, let's go back to what you just mentioned with the competitive pay and, and, and maybe other reasons why we're not being able to generate the teachers that we had in the past. Do you see the competitive pay being as much of an issue as, say, all of the bureaucracy and the other things that teachers have to deal with rather than just being able to teach in a classroom? I think it's a combination of both. I think it uh, it is... Pay is certainly a, a portion of it, but uh, the lack of respect given to educators. Uh, would, would we, we're a profession, teaching is a profession. Would we tell doctors how, how to treat their patients? Would we tell them, would we legislate rules on, on uh, uh, here's how you need to treat that, that appendix or here's how you need to operate on that? No. But we do that for education because everybody's an expert in education. We went through school, so we we know how it should be. Now, is that a case of of the the testing, right, all the standardized testings? And so, so sure. many of those rules are put into place because we're trying to get to a specific outcome as opposed to a more general outcome in seeing students growing the way that they really need to be? Uh, yes, absolutely. It, it all started with... Uh, 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 back in the early 2000s with um, uh, Bush's plan to uh, No Child Left Behind, uh, where we're trying to teach every kid to be an uh, engineer in college, and, and that's just uh, not going to happen. We should be working to figure out how kids are going to go in their career and prepare them for a career whether it be college, whether it be a vocation, whether it be uh, something like that, and, and, and move them forward to, in the best way possible. You, you deal with teachers, I'm sure, in every aspect from elementary to, uh, you know, the, the senior year, but also in your, what you would say, traditional school to your uh, votech type centers. Do we need more of, of that type of teaching as far as, you know, uh, having students be able to understand if they're not – geared towards going to college there are some tremendous career opportunities out oh, there if they yes. learn a skill yes there are and our vocational school is doing a great job uh, we have about 90 percent of the kids going through votech uh, pro programs that come out and get great jobs right out of high school uh, they pass the the uh, exams pass the test the certification test that they're given and get great jobs. I mean, I've visited the, the Votech in Cabell County, and they have kids coming out starting uh, high five figures, low six figure jobs uh, out of their Votech and their robotics and, and, and those types of things. So we can't think that every kid needs to, to be an engineer anymore. We have to prepare them. And one of the things you can do is, is to get kids look at their interest in, in middle schools and see the direction that they want to go. I would encourage every young person to go into plumbing. Oh, or electricity. <laughs> you can always yeah. use a plumber. If you've called a plumber recently, you know how expensive they are. <laughs> Call a plumber. When, when you can be find a plumber. one. Yes, right. exactly. Be and a when, plumber. And when you get certified as a plumber, you should be issued a belt so that your, your pants stay up while you're plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, optional. There, <laughs> see, there you are. You're treating plumbers like they treat teachers. You're trying to tell them how to wear their pants and everything else. <laughs> there, there is no end to the overreach exhibited uh, by these I mean, people. It, it, there's not. Everybody thinks they're experts. <laughs> Mr. Bodwell. I, Dale, I got I got I got some things I got got a, got a couple of issues with. First of all, doctors for the most part are paid privately. Education is our tax dollars, so the people do have a say. The legislature does have a say, whether teachers and educators like it or not. The second thing is, as far as uh, more financial education, more practical stuff. I think you hit on it. We have a lot of people that, that are not going to go to college, that are not going to be you know engineers doctors lawyers anything like that um, that the only time they are going to get a practical financial education mortgages compound interest how a 401k builds how to do a family budget is in high school 
And, you know, them not getting that in high school, I think the schools are leaving kids behind. I think that's something that should be mandatory everywhere, not something where you should be looking at it as they're letting the private schools off. Why do they want to overreach with us? What, uh, what do you think about that? Let, 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 me, let me start just by saying that uh, in, the, in the late 90s when I was teaching math at Princeton High School, I had a consumer math class, and in this consumer math class, we taught interest rates, checkbooks, financing, mortgages. Uh, they, we even had a lesson where the kids would pick out a car in the newspaper and then would research to see what dealer incentives you had. And I had the dealers around that we would call, and the kid would make an offer, and then the dealer would make a counter offer. things that you're going to use the rest of your life. But under No Child Left Behind, I stopped, had to stop teaching that so I could teach because I had to teach every kid algebra two. Now, I, I said once in one of the committees this year, I took algebra two in 1974, and people went, oh, gosh, she's really old. Uh, you you forget it. That was so the first thing that popped practice. into my head, too, Dale, just yeah, throwing really that out old. there. Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that <laughs> would. Uh, that, that's why I, I need when you – when he signs that radon kit, making him big letters. <laughs> big letters, <laughs> which is hard for me. No, and I, <laughs> and, hey, brother, I, I turned sixty last week. I need those big letters too. No, and, I, and Dale, I agree with you. I mean, I think, and I think it's wonderful that you were teaching that. I think all kids should be taught mm -hmm. that. Absolutely, they should. And and I, and and we already require a financial literacy in in our classes. It's part of a a uh, it's part of the civics class, but I think. You, you need to, to decide, if I'm teaching math, do I need calculus or do I need the uh, financial literacy? And, and not every kid's going to need calculus. So not, not, many, to, not many kids are going to need yeah. A very small percentage of kids are going to need calculus, and every single human being is going to need financial literacy. Absolutely. So you need to give them give give our teachers the freedom and I, I call that academic freedom to decide what your kids need and and get them to the places they need to go if algebra 2 works like it did for me you might be able to confuse the dealer and get a better deal on that car if you could apply a little bit of algebra 2 in the purchase of that vehicle I was more thinking confuse the dealer in blackjack <laughs> you know the algebra 2 <laughs> um, well, I'm, uh, after, after my last trip to the uh, the track down here, I obviously didn't teach that very well in blackjack either. <laughs> hey, let me ask one more quick question. Where is this conversation going? <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Uh, hit me, dealer. Um, I, and that's funny because I, I used to teach uh, probability and statistics too. Mm -hmm. And I always played blackjack with the kids in, in probability and statistics because it's a great way to, for them to, to sure. understand real life what uh, what the probability is there's nothing more fun than mathematical probability that's, and that makes how, me that how, makes me a little that's different how, that's how i paid for lunch the rest of the year <laughs> nothing <laughs> wrong with that <laughs> taking money from the pockets that, of eighth graders that is, that is a joke please don't <laughs> yes <laughs> please, please please don't call it or text or that was a joke let me uh, let me get back to what Rob said at the beginning when when you were talking about what I mean. Wonderful to have smaller class sizes at the younger grades. I mean, it, it, we would all yeah. love to see that. And we definitely have the money for it. We don't have the teachers. Have they? And I know it's been considered. I know it gets shot down by teachers, shot down by unions, shot down by everybody. Recruiting older professionals, people who have made it in their careers, people who have been successful in in business and other fields. Recruiting them and making it a damn sight easier to become a teacher at a later age, not have to jump through as many hoops. Um, because, I mean, I know there are lots of people who have retired and still want to work and would love to give back to society. And there's no greater way to give back to society, I mean, besides military and law enforcement, the, the big three, military, law enforcement, and teaching. Those are the, well, the three things, three most important things in our society. Right, it doesn't get shot down. There's actually eight different ways, alternative it's alternative certification ways that you can go into teaching right now. Uh, we've tried troops to teachers. We've tried bringing uh, the retired chemist from from D Dow here in the Nile Valley. We've tried uh, all different ways of 
making it easier for people to go into education. And what you find is those people don't stay uh, very long. That, that teaching is a very difficult job. And while you may know the, the subject area, the uh, child classroom management and, and those types of things are, are what drive them out of the classroom. Do you think, I mean, just to, to jump a little to the side when you say classroom management, I mean, do you think the, just the overall lack of respect and everything with classroom sure. management is just what's driving teachers away? Sure. It's, it's uh, uh, the, the, what we saw in, in with our Solutions to Success forums that we had across the state. And, and one of the top three issues was the, the discipline. And what you saw is that uh, people believe that we need to be fair and consistent, but there has to be that student accountability and there has to be the parent accountability too. And that's, that's the part that, that's missing in all this is, uh, you know, I, I, I always hate to say this, but back in my day, when you got in trouble at school, you were in trouble at home. And, uh, now many of our teachers find if, if a kid gets in trouble at school, it's the teacher's fault and the parent doesn't believe their child. Has, has done what they say they did. Dale Lee is our guest. He is the president of the West Virginia Education Association. And, Dale, let's continue along that theme there, too, because in our interviews with members of the House of Delegates and the Senate, one of the things that they are trying to address this year is making students more accountable for their performance in the cl classroom and their behavior as well. And some of that included holding kids behind a grade if they don't achieve at least some of the minimum standards necessary. What is a way to account for a student who perhaps is a discipline problem in a classroom, uh, perhaps uh, has uh, so many challenges academically that they can't make the grade and, uh, and uh, achieve at the next grade level? What are our solutions for that in an ideal world? Well, in an ideal world, one of the things that we did back in 2014 uh, when we were funding innovation zones in West Virginia and, and giving schools an opportunity to see what their school needed and, and ask for waivers and think outside the box and, and what they wanted to do. One of the things that we funded was um, alternative settings in elementary schools where that if a kid was a disruption in the class, they could pull him and put him in this alternative setting there at the school where the uh, then the teacher could work on the academics and the the uh, uh, the discipline area the, the the anger management or whatever the the uh, discipline issue was and so you what you saw is you saw referrals go down and you saw uh, academic achievement go up but in our state's infinite wisdom we stopped funding innovation zones. Uh, when, if we're going to tackle this, and first of all, it's not going to be a single silver bullet that's going to do this. I mean, while the K through three is a good start, it's not going to be the silver bullet, the magic silver bullet. And then the next year, you see academic achievement rise tremendously. You got to do it on a on a lot of different areas. And even if you're looking at K through three. What about those fourth graders through 12th graders? You have to look at ways to reach them, too. You have to give them some tutoring. You have to get them in places where they can catch up. So so there's a lot that's going to be involved in this. Uh, we didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to fix it overnight. Matt Miller. As far as that fix and, and not being able to fix it overnight, what do you see as a good starting point? Do you believe the, the idea of, of this bill that, that is going to put some more aids in and focus on the kindergarten through third grade, is that a good place to start? That, that is a good place to start, but it's a good place to start that will show uh, achievement four or five years down the road. You're not going to see them immediately. Uh, that's why I say it will help those kids, but what about the fourth graders to the 12th graders right now? Uh, you have to look at ways to, to help them and, and get them uh, on par. And and there's, you know, the best way to do this is to bring the teachers in and say, what do we need to do? And let's think outside the box. Uh, it, it may be something uh, really far out there as, as uh, ungraded 
K through two, where you're you're with students on your uh, skill level and getting them getting them through. I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm a high school special ed math teacher. You know, I'm not the expert in elementary. So bring them in and see what we need to do. Is it getting harder and harder to try to push through those types of ideas, though? The outside of the box. Are we so boxed in in education? Oh yeah, I believe that. Uh, you, that's that's what I loved about the innovation zones is is you could try a lot of different things uh, and let the, the the educators decide at the school what they wanted to try, and you saw successes. But uh, if if you have a cookie cutter approach and you have a cookie cutter uh, curriculum, then then you lose that ability to reach every kid. When I was teaching math, I may have three Algebra One classes. And after the first week, we were never on the same page because kids learn at different lap paces and, and uh, math, math something that you have to get the concept today before you can go on tomorrow. Have we thought about going back to tracking? I mean, when I was in school, like really, we had three three classes for each grade. There were the, 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 the bright kids, the kids who were excelling. Then there were the kids who were, you know, doing okay. And then there were the kids who really needed a lot of extra help. I mean, I think when, when we started being a little more mamby-pamby and mixing everybody together, you know, you get the, then the, the smarter kids, the, I mean, the kids who are ahead are getting bored. The kids who don't know what they're doing are feeling less than instead of feeling, hey, I'm getting extra help, I'm building up, I'm getting better. I mean, is there any is there any movement toward going back to that? Because obviously test scores were a heck of a lot higher back then. People were learning better. It, it worked. It may have it may have upset some people, but you know, life upsets you. If you get out of school and you if you get out of school and you, you're not proficient in math and reading, you know, life is is going to you know keep you down forever. Well, one of the things my last year in the classroom, which was 15 years ago, uh, it's hard to believe that it's been that long. But it's the first year that we did inclusion in math, where we had we mixed our special needs kids with our regular ed kids in in the math classes, and, and I had always been against that. I didn't think it would work. You needed to have extra help for for my students I, as a special needs teacher. Uh, but what we saw is that the the brighter kids were helping other kids, and they, and kids learn very well from each other and you have to have the right combination of a regular ed teacher and a special ed teacher in there both of them have to be teachers not one of them uh the paper pushers type situation uh one of the algebra one classes that we had i was teaching with one of my former basketball players and he and i just had a great camaraderie to begin with we found that at the end of the semester a little girl with the second highest average in the class was a special needs kid. So it worked. It, it gave you the opportunity. But but you have to have the right combination in that. Uh, so so the tracking is one way of doing it. The other way is, is to, to uh, let kids help each other, particularly with the group work and things. So, so there's a lot of ways to do that. Dale, thank you so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Well, I, I just can't wait to get my autograph copy. <laughs> <laughs> Feel better. Have a good t- a good day, okay, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks. Dale.